welcome to our online worship at Shiloh United Methodist Church on this 17th Sunday after Pentecost. We're so happy that you've jo chosen to join us for worship this day. I'm Jerry Suit, the traditional worship coordinator here at Shiloh, and we hope that you're blessed in this time together. Now let us invite the Lord to be with us in this time of worship. Eternal God, as we gather in this time and place, we are reminded of your mighty works amid the great drama of human history. We praise you for never giving up on us, for loving us, and a love from which nothing can separate us. May we become more aware of your activity and presence that we will see you more clearly at work in the midst of all the pain and joy of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello friends, welcome to worship here at Shiloh United Methodist Church. I hope you've enjoyed the worship time leading up to, to this moment. I am Kurt Tomlinson and I have the privilege of being the pastor around here. If you've been tuning in with us, you know we've had a couple of sermon series along the way. If you're brand new, welcome to the beginning of a new sermon series. Uh, this series is called Finding Your Place. And what we're going to do over the next four weeks is we're going to work on helping you find your place with God, with your faith journey. And we're going to look at how we do that in several different ways. We're going to talk about finding your place in God's family. That's what we're going to look at uh, today. Then we're, next week, we're going to look at finding your place in God's plan. Uh, we'll, we'll discover that God has a plan. It may not be what we think it is. We may not even think it's a plan. But it is, and God's got it taken care of. Then uh, we're going to look at finding our place at God's place. And we all know that God's place is the church. And through the miracle of electronic broadcast, you can even find a place uh, at God's church. Even if this is the only medium uh, you interact with us, we'll find a place for you. You can find a place at God's place. And then finally, uh, we'll explore finding a place at God's table, where we will wrap this up, this series up by realizing that no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, what baggage we bring, we are welcome at God's table. And that's 
uh, all about communion, and, but it's more. It's about fellowship and community and in all of those things. On the last Sunday of this series, if, if you're ever going to join us here live in person, I would encourage you to do that on that last Sunday, the first Sunday of October, because we're going to have a ministry fair. Because we thought after we've helped you find your place for four weeks, we should provide a place for you to find your place here around here at Shiloh United Methodist Church. So we're going to set up in what we call our gathering space. Uh, and we're going to have all of our ministries set up so that you can see the breadth and the depth of the mission and ministry we do around here and find ways where you can connect and uh, be a part of what God's doing, not only in the church, but in our community. All right, let's get started with finding your place in God's family. And to do that, I want to start with some of our expressions of exasperation. That's the fancy way of saying what we say when we're frustrated or when we see something that's really, really bizarre. You know, some of the ones I've used over the years are fiddlesticks. Yes, I really use the word fiddlesticks. Or, oh, bother. When I'm in an Irish mood, I say, saints preserve us. In case you didn't understand my Irish accent, that saints preserve us us okay oh for crying out loud or give me a break or I might borrow from Charlie Brown good grief uh, and my favorite that sounds vaguely Jewish but it really comes from a grown up in upstate New York Oy vey. but there's one in my family that seems to summarize our exasperation our frustration or you know when we see things that are really really strange or out there or bizarre we, we use the word seriously, and, and, and it has to have a, a sarcastic tone in the midst of it, like, seriously? For instance, I recently came across a survey put out by United Airlines. They, they, they asked all their passengers, do you go to the bathroom while on, your, uh, on the airplane? 38% said, no, I never go to the bathroom while I'm on the airplane. 60% said, yes, I go to the bathroom all the time when I'm on an airplane. Now, if you're good at math, you've already figured out that adds up to 98%. That means there's 2% of people that responded to their survey that they're not sure whether or not they go to the bathroom while they're, not, while they're on an airplane. Seriously? Or how about this? There was a guy who got um, uh, sentenced to 90 days in prison. He served 89 days and decided on that 89th day he's going to break out of prison. On the 89th day, seriously? <laughs> or how about this last one? There was a, a guy who decided to rob a store, a seriously moment to begin with. But then while he was robbing the store, the clerk asked, hey, hey, can I make a phone call? Well, I guess, go ahead and make a phone call. And then the robber was, was surprised when the police showed up just a, a, a minute later. Seriously? Yeah. So let's turn this study of studies uh, of uh, uh, expressions of exasperation into a faith discussion. And in order to do that, we got to turn to the Bible. And we turn to one of the fundamental books of the Bible, the book of Romans. It's in the New Testament, comes right after the Gospels and the book of Acts. And it is one of those fundamental books that helped us form what it is that we believe as followers of Jesus Christ. And of all of the chapters in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8 is the most fundamental of all of the, the, the teachings we have in the book of Romans. Chapter 8 really is a comprehensive list of, of the things we continue to believe as Christians, as followers uh, of Jesus Christ. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to find your Bible. I want you to bookmark Romans 8 because when you need to know the basic building blocks of the faith, you go back to Romans 8. Now, let me give you a list because it can be hard to read and you might have to figure it out along the way. So this is the revised Pastor Kurt version of what's in uh, Romans 8. There's 10. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. God searches our heart. The saint the Spirit, excuse me, intercedes. That's a big church word. In other words, the Spirit works for, helps, looks out for the saints of God. All things work together for good for those that love God. We are a part of God's family. If God is for us, we will prevail. God justifies, another big church word. God saves, restores, and blesses us. God loved us so much that he sent his son to us as a sacrifice, and Christ died for us. Us. And then finally, nothing 
And I'll add two more nothings. Nothing, nothing, nothing in all of creation will be able to separate us from God's love. All these really good, really basic, but really good things in one chapter. Now, because these are so basic, we might wonder how God reacts when we forget one of them. That we live our lives as if one of them doesn't exist, or more than one of them doesn't exist, either accidentally or intentionally. We might think, because we have our expressions of exasperation, that it would be easy to imagine that God takes his hand, slaps himself in the forehead, and says, Seriously? I have to go over this again? Haven't you gotten it yet? Because the reality is that all of us have forgotten these basic things given to us in Romans 8 and elsewhere in the Bible. And when I say all of those, all of us, I raise my hand high as the chief among sinners, friends. Because the reality is all of us have forgotten that the Spirit is there in our weakness. We've all overlooked the, the fact that the Spirit searches our hearts. We all get so caught up in life that we've missed that the Spirit has interceded or been there on behalf of us. We've all doubted that all things work for good for those that love God because the news has been so horrible. We've all turned our backs on God's family at a time or another. We've all forgotten that in the midst of our lives that if God is for us, we will prevail. We've all missed the fact that God justifies, in other words, saves and restores and blesses us. There's been time in all of our lives when we've forgotten to live reflecting the fact that God loved us so much that he sent his son to us. All too often we have to be reminded that Christ died for us. We've all tried to qualify or change or add to or subtract from the idea that nothing, 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 can separate us from God's love. Now I share this with you not to make you feel silly or worse yet, to make you feel guilty, but to help us all understand that when we forget these basic truths given to us in Romans 8 and, and other places in the Bible, we appear to God like those who have forgotten the most basic things. And we might forgive God if God reacted the same way that we react to these other stories. Seriously? You don't know whether or not you go to the bathroom? Seriously? You broke out of jail one day before your sentence was up and you would be completely free? Seriously? You let them, you, you robbed a store? If that wasn't bad enough, you let them make a phone call? Seriously? In the same way, whenever we turn away from God, Whenever we have doubts, whenever we, we live like or begin to tell ourselves that God doesn't exist or God can't help us or God isn't listening or God isn't real or that God's agent, the church, is flawed and irrelevant and silly and hypocritical and evil, I can imagine God. I would give God the, 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 the excuse to look at us and, and go, seriously? I have to go through this again? And we act this way because, let's face it, life is hard. And friends, when life is hard, it's so easy to forget even these most basic things. It's easy to turn away. And there's so many things that can, can do this to us. It, it could be a diagnosis or a job loss or a financial disaster or maybe it's a transfer or an accident. Maybe you got bad news about someone you deeply loved, whether it was a child or a grandchild or a niece, a nephew, a parent, a grandparent. Maybe you had a death of someone so very close to you, a parent, a child, a grandparent. Maybe you have to make a major life decision that's gonna, that, that you never thought you'd have to make. Maybe it's about giving up your driver's license or going into a nursing home. I mean, I, I could go on and on and on, couldn't I? But no matter what does it, if God was like us, when, when we did these things, when we forgot these most basic things, he might look at us and go, seriously? Now here's the part where I get to tell you the good news. God doesn't react this way. Because God, well, he's God. 
As humans, we lose our patience or we don't see the whole story or we jump to conclusions. These are things that God just never does. So instead of responding like we might, God responds lovingly with a gentle, calm response. And in doing so, he goes back to the basics. Romans 8, 28. All things. Notice there's no qualifiers. There's no all things except. No, all things work together for good for those that love God. Now, this isn't some Pollyanna pie in the sky denial of reality that substitutes imitation happiness for the brokenness of our hearts. Rather, it's a reassurance that no matter how difficult it may seem in the moment, God has got you in the palm of his hand. That no matter where you are, when you are, who you are, what you've done or not done, no matter what, you are nothing less. Friends, hear this very clearly. You are nothing less than a child of God. Right now, with no conditions, with no exceptions. And if we trust him, and if we love him, The one who has the eternal and infinite perspective, he will make sure that even out of the deepest of tragedies, good will come. But again, it may not be in the way that we want it or even expect it to be. Because notice that verse doesn't say that we will avert disaster. It doesn't say that life will be easy. It doesn't say that we will be rich and happy and the heartbreaks of life will never come. It doesn't say we'll always get along with everyone. It surely doesn't say we'll be able to avoid the conflicts of life. It says if you identify with me, if you follow me, if you accept my acceptance to be my child, if you choose to love me, that no matter what happens in your life, I will make good come from it, even if that good takes years to get here. And here's the really hard part. Even if you're not the beneficiary of that good, even if you don't experience the good. The best example of this I ever have seen happened 28 years ago this past May. It happened on a summer day to a special young man. My cousin Nate was an outdoor kinds of kids. He, he, he loved being outdoors. He lived out in the country. He loved to hunt. He loved to fish. He loved, the, they had a cabin in the woods. He loved being outdoors and he loved God. He was a church kid. They, they were building a, a church that he was going to. They were building a bigger church because their church had grown. And he, he came after school every day to volunteer to help build that church. We would find out later that uh, he went to visit sick kids in the hospital. But one day in May, he was taking the next of hundreds of rides he had taken from their cabin in the woods back to their house on their ATV, which is a three-wheeled motorized uh, gasoline-powered little bike. He wasn't being irresponsible, and he wasn't being a jerk. He was just driving back, and he caught a rut in the mud wrong, and it threw him from the ATV into a tree, And he didn't make it. At his funeral, lived in a little town. At his funeral, hundreds of people came. They filled to overflowing that church, so they had to put an overflow tent outside, and that was full to overflowing. I tell you all this to get to his father, my cousin Steve, who not only had the courage to stand up in the pulpit, talk about his son but he said this remarkable thing now remember this is a man who had lost his only beloved son who he was incredibly close to and he began his remembrance with these words I thank God and they continue for every moment of every day I got to spend with my son I knew the minute he was born, he was special. And I am glad that we cherished every moment we had together. Then he went out on to pour out his heart, share his pain and what he was going through with the loss of Nate. But 
All of it was, was couched in his love he had for his son and the love he knew he had from God. And since that day, I've used this story in a number of places. Steve has used this story in a number of places. Others have used this story in a number of places. People have been changed. Lives have been changed. Hundreds, maybe thousands of lives have been changed because Steve was brave enough to stand up in the pulpit at his son's funeral and thank God. All things work for good for those that love God. And friends, what works good for the individual works for our church as well. See, so often as a church, we forget how important we are to God. We panic over the things we try to control, the, the size and enrollment of our Sunday school, the loss of our status as an institution within our government and its policies, the number of people in the pews, whether we sing contemporary or traditional music, the rise of sports and the decline of youth in our churches, the distance between conservative and progressive church attitudes, to which I wouldn't blame God if he looked at our churches and slapped himself in the forehead and said, seriously? But God responds again, not with exasperation, but again with love. From Romans 8, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. So when we begin to doubt the effectiveness of the church, when we looked at the flawed people who have been and continue to be a part of the church, when we look around and see the increasing numbers of people who are fleeing the church, when we hear about the growth of those who are increasingly ambivalent to the church and we wonder if the church is even relevant in mo anymore, we wonder if the church will even survive, we hear the loving words of our leader, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus in our Lord. Friends, in the midst of our worry, we need to look to our past. And if anything should convince us that God is not going to let us fail, it is the past. And I invite you to look past 1818, when a few people got together in a class meeting here in Delhi Township. I, look at, I invite you to look past 1784, when the Methodist movement became a church here in the United States. I invite you to look past 1738, when John Wesley had his heart strangely warmed and the Methodist movement began. I invite you to look past that, all the way back to the beginning. When Jesus looked at the disciples and said, you're my plan, you are to establish the church and the church is my plan to transform the world. And over the course of 2,000 years, we humans, you and I, and you study our history and you, if we're honest about our history, we've done everything we possibly can to kill that vision. It should have been a dead a thousand times over. We've tried to destroy what Jesus set into action through corruption, distrust, hatred, using the name of Jesus to kill, to destroy, to conquer, and to oppress. And the church is still here. That proves that God's not going to allow this beloved church, the church he created through his son, to fade away or be brought low by something as simple as humans being flawed or secular government. You know, Jesus once said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to the government what is theirs, but give to God what is God's. You know what he was saying? God's not afraid of the government. God's not afraid of secularism. God's not afraid of our mistakes, our corruption, or even our hypocrisy. God is not afraid of sports or our ambivalence or our lack of faithfulness. The God who called Christ the firstborn of all creation and then chose to shape the rest of us into the image of this Christ, this God is not afraid of anything at all in all of creation. And he will sustain and empower and overcome through his agent on earth. And if you heard me in the first series, you know who that agent is. We are God's plan A and there is no plan B. That's why Romans 8 ends with this amazing proclamation. Nothing. But when he says nothing, he means nothing. We'll be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Why? Because God has the power to make us succeed. God has the ability to not let us fail. Not yesterday. Not today. 
and not tomorrow, not until he chooses to have Jesus return, and not even then. Friends, the reality is God wins. The church will prevail. So we need to exile our worry. We need to abolish our fear. We need to excommunicate the talk about the church failing and roll up our sleeves and get to work in joining God in transforming the world and let God take care of everything else. So here's my invitation for you this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whenever you're tuning into this. Reclaim your inheritance. Reclaim your identity individually as a child of God. Chosen adopted, loved, cherished, and treasured by the God who created you just the way he wanted you and wants nothing more than to have you love him back with your entire body, mind, soul, and spirit. And collectively as the body of Christ, as God's plan for the world, God wants nothing more than for us to band together and transform the world. Say this with me, I am a child of God. Say it with me, ready? I am a child of God. I know you're too cool to talk to the screen and to the crazy pastor on the other side of it, but I want you to say these words out loud because it matters. You ready? Say it with me. I am a child of God. See how that feels? So hear this, child of God. We know that no matter what comes our our way, God will make it good. And as a church full of children of God, let us proclaim that we are the family of God and we all have a place in God's family. And as the family of God, we will do nothing less than transform the world. Amen? Amen. Hey friends, I'm sitting out here because the sermon was all about being a child of God, being part of the the community of faith. Because you have a place here. Even if you just tune in on online each and every week, I want you to know you have a place here at Shiloh United Methodist Church. You have a place in the family of God. And I'm glad you've tuned in. And if you ever find your way to be here in person, make sure you introduce yourself to me and let me know you've been watching online. I'll I'll rejoice with you and be just glad that you're among us. And as you get ready to go out of this broadcast and and encounter the rest of your week, know that there might be some hard stuff out there. But my prayer for you is that you will always remember that you are a child of God. And no matter what comes your way, nothing's going to be able to separate you from God's love. And that somehow, some way, You may not be able to see it. You may not even experience it. But some way God will make good from whatever hard thing is going on in your life. Go forth. May the peace, the power, the love, and the grace of our God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.